Our uh, speaker today is uh, Professor Jacob Hickman uh, from the Department of, of Anthropology. Uh, he is a wonderful teacher and a, uh, a really thoughtful scholar and uh, a really multidisciplinary anthropologist. Uh, Jacob told me uh, earlier today that he went on his mission to Alaska where he was converted to all things Hmong. Uh, and it uh, transformed his life in, in many ways in terms of his interaction with uh, the Hmong diaspora. Uh, Professor Hickman is, specializes in psychological and medical anthropology. Uh, uh, he's uh, also interested in cultural psychology and the anthropology of religion. I think we're going to see some of that today. Uh, and a specialist in Southeast Asian studies. Uh, since uh, 2004, he's conducted uh, more than 50 months of ethnographic fieldwork among Hmong communities in uh, diverse places around the world, including Thailand, Vietnam, China, France, Australia, Alaska, Wisconsin, and Minnesota. Uh, he graduated from Brigham Young University in anthropology and psychology um, and uh, received his PhD from the University of Chicago in uh, comparative human development. Professor Hickman's research has been funded by Fulbright as well as the National Science Foundation and uh, we've been lucky enough that he has directed ethnographic field schools uh, through the Kennedy Center uh, for the past 10 years. And undergraduate collaborators have been a really productive force in, uh, in his intellectual journey and in his research. Uh, beyond his research across the global, global Hmong di diaspora over the last several years, he's also been doing some interesting work in comparative projects on ethno-nationalism in Northern Ireland and even on cattle ranching in the American West. Um, and uh, we're really delighted that he is participating in our lecture series this semester. Please join me in welcoming Professor Hickman. Um, thank you very much, Quinn. Really appreciate the kind invitation to speak here in this series in preserving and transforming culture, something that us th anthropologists think about quite a bit. Uh, as well as to the Kennedy Center for uh, hosting this lecture, and uh, as well as to Shang Nai for that uh, uh, opening uh, invocation. It's nice to be able to talk about millenarianism with the blessing of the Spirit, right? Um, and first and foremost, I want to thank all my Hmong friends, family, and interlocutors who have so graciously received me into their lives and homes and religious communities over the course of my career, and I hope as will become apparent over the course of the research that I'm presenting today. Um, so, millenarian, so, and uh, just a quick note, this is a paper, I'm presenting a version of the paper, I'm going to try and spare you some of the more gory technical details, but has been accepted into the Journal of the Royal Anthropological Institute, and I'm really looking forward to the feedback because I've been asked to, all my revisions have been accepted, except I have to cut 700 words, but I can still tweak things, so I'm hoping to get some uh, productive comments from you afterwards. So. Uh, I apologize, I'm going to read part of it, but I'm going to try and st uh, keep it engaging, and then we'll have some fun pictures and slides to look at. So, millenarian activists face the problem of having to convince people not only that the world is not what it appears to be, but that also a total transformation of the world as we know it is both inevitable and desirable. The current state of the world is seen to be utterly corrupt. But what is the relationship between an imagined utopian future and a venerated past within this logic? While other social movements generally ground claims of authenticity in some continuity with history, such as the notion of tradition, this rarely tends to be the case in millenarian cosmologies. So in this notion, tradition typically equates to something like historical continuity of a practice, right? But in millenarianism, oftentimes it's actually quite the opposite. While a utopian future may recover some moral essence of the past, the utopia itself is unprecedented. It turns out that the authenticity of the things that will bring about the millennium, new rituals, new doctrines, new practices, and new cultural forms, does not turn on their historical inertia, but rather on their very novelty. And perhaps paradoxically, it is this novelty that is uniquely able to capture the moral sense of that venerated past 
and project that moral state forward into a utopian future. So if I am right about the structure of this logic, and frankly in this talk I'm going to try and unpack that logic and make the case that it is common in millenarian theologies, then this begs the question of how it is that millenarian leaders are able to convince some people of the authenticity of their movements, and why do they fail to convince and become to be recognized as authentic by others? In short, how does one restore something that has never been? Um, while many movements find no shortage of people who are sympathetic to their arguments or even eager to join their movements, outsiders commonly perceive the disjuncture between past, present, and future as irrational and therefore discount the transcendental claims and worldviews of these groups. These are the common conclusions drawn by social scientists who are eager to either discount the religious frameworks or more often, as social scientists and producing social theories, reduce those frameworks to things like social and political deprivation, to cognitive dissonance, or oftentimes to mere psychopathy. Those people are just flipping crazy, right? Law enforcement organizations drawn from these social scientific explanations, and there's volumes of collaborative law enforcement academic accounts about new religious movements that demonstrate this fact. Uh, and of course, law enforcement and social scientists are all drawing from the same pool of cultural assumptions about how these people are just crazy, right? Um, and, but it's not just law enforcement and social scientists. These explanations uh, pervade pedestrian, public, and even journalistic accounts of apocalyptic and utopian movements. Think about Waco and the Branch Davidians, Heaven's Gate, Jonestown, the idea of drinking the Kool-Aid, and so on, right? And um, in another part of my work, I, I attack these theories head on and, and try to argue, among other things, that actually if you dig down into the logic of these ways of thinking, a lot of these primary, even canonical social scientific theories are inadequate in really understanding what's going on in these communities. And oftentimes it's the most extreme forms that are propped up as if these are representative of all millenarians, or we conveniently ignore the apocalyptic thinking in our own society. So my colleague Joe Webster and I point to climate change alarmism, for example, as fundamentally a millenarian apocalyptic logic. Think about tipping points, points of no return, and so on. But that's not my focus today. What I want to accomplish this afternoon is to unpack the logic from a Hmong religious point of view. <clears throat> um, because the variety of Hmong millenarian movements with whom I've been spending time since 2008 reveal a logic that undercuts these common critiques of millenarian religion more broadly. And by the way, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is, uh, as evidenced by the name of the institution, is a millenarian religion, right? Our theology is fundamentally millenarian. So uh, let's start with this question, of what, what do I mean by millenarianism? Uh, it's not that complicated. You could put it in relationship to a whole bunch of other terms that you'll be familiar with. Utopianism, apocalypticism. So utopian frameworks tend to focus on the goodness that is to come. Apocalypticism tends to focus on, you know, uh, wading through, you know, mass uh, destruction and, and so on that is to come. And most frameworks have uh, elements of both of those. Revitalization movements are trying to recover something in their movements. There's a massive anthropological literature on cargo cults. We could talk about millennialism, which is an iteration of millenarianism as a term, or messianism focuses on a particular savior at the, at the center of a movement, and similarly charismatic and prophetic movements. There's also a broader term that's used in the literature, simply new religious movements. For me, millenarianism is kind of my umbrella term to encompass all of these, right? Um, having written and thought about this stuff for a long time, I'm not going to get into the logic, but the way I'm using that in my talk today is kind of as an umbrella movement to think about, uh, you know, all of these phenomena, if that makes sense. So I'm using it in the broadest possible term. Uh, Joe Webster and I, in uh, an in-press um, piece in the Oxford Handbook of the Anthropology of Religion, we define millenarianism, we kind of point to three characteristics that millenarian logics have. And again, uh, I, would, you know, I would point to uh, you know, several quote-unquote secular millenarian movements that are fundamentally part of the same phenomenon that we're describing, including climate change activism, you know, concerns about the artificial intelligence apocalypse and so on, right? Every bit as much as the Branch Davidians, Hmong millenarian religion, 
the theology of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints and so on, right? And the characteristics that we would point to is that all of these provide a framework for building a moral vision of the world, right? So what we call moral world building. Also, uh, the second point is that there's, we have to pay attention to the temporal imagination of those movements, that they imagine time to unfold in particular ways with regards to that moral vision. And that what's important is thinking about periods of time in relation to the moral state of that world. And, that, and then point three is that um, these movements tend to ultimately seek to transfigure everyday imminence into the image of the transcendent. So oftentimes, the state of the world might be seen as fallen and needing to fall back in sync with uh, you know, its utopian ideal and so on. So that's what I mean by millenarianism. Now, why Hmong millenarianism? So just to give you a little bit of background about Hmong. So Hmong are a highland ethnic minority group, originally from the highlands of southwest China and southeast Asia. Um, and there is an extensive history of new religious movements across this region and among Hmong uh, communities in particular, both historically and in the present day, as you'll see in a few moments. These movements continue with a prolific number of movements currently vying against one another to unite global Hmong society. So there is an irony here and to, me, to use a sort of like, you know, local historical point of reference, imagine a bunch of Joseph Smiths at a similar point in time in a similar region claiming to have similar things that are going to unite, you know, the world, but all knowing that each other exist and they're competing for adherents to join their movement, right? There's something along those lines is happening with all of these Hmong movements. And uh, among all of these Hmong millenarian movements that I've done work, they know about each other. Sometimes they talk to each other and try and convert each other to say, no, our writing system and our new ritual system is the one that's going to uni unify among people. So that's just to give you a sense. But there's also a rich historical uh, trajectory of these movements as well. So just to um, give you a sense of who Hmong people are, where they are in the world, so you can see our little subset of Southwest China, Southeast Asia here. So this is a map of uh, the sort of distribution of uh, Hmongic-speaking peoples. Uh, and it is worth noting that um, it is an ethnonym that Hmong people in all of these different, and I've been visited most of these regions broadly, not all of these little dots, but I've done field work and, you know, close colleagues who have done field work, uh, it, deeper field work in, say, the far reaches of, up, you know, this part of, you can't really see the dot here, I apologize. Um, but at any rate, my point is that the term Hmong, these people r recognize each other as co-ethnics generally, right? That is not to make an argument about the homogeneity of Hmong because there's absolutely significant variation, and yet there is a broader unifying imagined ethno-national project of Hmongness, if that makes sense. Um, and you see that not just in um, the... Uh, historical distribution among people across Southwest China and Southeast Asia, but into what is now a global diaspora. So this uh, image right here is a uh, Hmong depiction of that history. So as you go down across this story cloth, you're moving both across space and time, so both south and forward in time. So this is a depiction of the ancient Hmong kingdom and Hmong fighting the Chinese on horseback, you know, fleeing China when the ancient Hmong kingdom fell. Uh, and this would be, you know, the colonial, this battery is totally dying, but this middle section would be the, uh, you know, the uh, early to late colonial periods and fighting uh, both against the French and then fighting with the United States against the Patet Lao communist movement in Laos and losing that, uh, you know, war, that conflict and then people fleeing across the Mekong River down here in the bottom in refugee camps. They're raising their arms to swear their oaths to get refugee status jumping on planes to the United States. So you have several hundred years and several hundred miles of imagined Hmong history in this, uh, in this singular icon. Um, and this just kind of uh, describes the same thing, but I'm gonna skip ahead here. Um, now, uh, this is simply to say that in the global phase of that diaspora, most of that resulted from the Second Indo-Chinese War and Hmong people being fled as, you know, spread as refugees, seeking refugee status and asylum in all sorts of countries. And I've done field work in all of these different places between 2004 and 2019. So, all right. Um, while I was conducting field work in Thailand on a completely different topic, I was actually studying moral development, I was struck by the number of new religious movements that I'd encountered in the one community where I was working. 
I was asked by three distinct millenarian activists for assistance to get in touch with the United Nations Security Council. Each of these leaders, and some of these leaders had a fully formed movement, some of them had movements that they assured me would come to, you know, uh, out of the darkness eventually, but each of them described how a cataclysmic global war would transpire at any moment, and when it does, the political cards would be reshuffled in Southeast Asia, and they needed to maintain contact with world leadership in order to assure that a Hmong state would emerge within this reshuffling. Having attended many of these meetings and interviews, my Hmong, my Hmong research collaborator came to refer to these groups as the World War III people. So he himself was Hmong, not a participant in these millenarian movements. And he, this is my long-term research assistant collaborator. He would, he would sort of like jokingly refer to all these different groups as the World War III people, right? So that's to give you a sense that there are different views of these millenarian movements within Hmong society. Um, now, uh, I would say that my Hmong collaborator research assistant was uh, perhaps more critical. And he would say that some of them were crazy. And this is one of those things where, you know, we look at these other crazy movements and say they're crazy. If you actually take a step back and look, a lot of the people who are involved in these movements they actually have had their entire world upended in the scope of their lifetime. And in fact, the political cards in Southeast Asia, the political orders as they knew it, were in fact upended and overturned. So if you actually think about the context where these are coming from, it is not irrational to imagine that the global cards, or the, the political cards might be reshuffled once again, and that in fact a Hmong state might emerge out of that. In fact, there's good evidence that with the CIA involvement in the secret war in Laos, some promises that were sort of insinuating at an eventual Hmong state were part of that calculus to try and get Hmong special guerrilla units to fight with the CIA against the Patet Lao movement. But we don't need to get uh, too deeply into that. Um, let's see here. So, and one of the points I want to make is here is that by sheer proportions, the total number of Hmong people that are involved in these former movements is relatively small, right? But there's kind of two interesting facts here. One is the pervasiveness of these movements. I've worked with movements most extensively in uh, Thailand and uh, Minnesota, but there are also a large number of movements. I spent time in the uh, highlands of uh, Cairn, Australia, um, and uh, in Vietnam, there was a big movement that was actually violently put down in 2011. So they, these movements are broadly distributed across Hmong communities, right? Even though the relative, the per, relative proportion of Hmong who would consider themselves members of the movement is relatively small. That's one point. The second point I would make is that <clears throat> this millenarian ethos is actually broadly distributed even in traditional religion. And I'm not going to go through this, but this is a funeral song that is very common that in, as you're sending, so this is actually the, the performance, they're starting to perform this song, you can see the casket there, they're sending this person back to the ancestral village, and as they do, they're gearing up for war against the Chinese, because inevitably, that war with the Chinese that unseated the Hmong kingdom and granted the Chinese dynasties the mandate of heaven when Hmong lost the mandate of heaven needs to be recovered, and that war is inevitable uh, in the post-mortal sojourn, if that makes sense. And there are a number of other things that I could point to. This is actually a ritual. I don't know where the volume is. Can you turn the volume like, almost completely down? Okay, thank you. I'm just going to talk over it, actually. Yeah, actually, go back down if you would. Um, so this is a funeral ritual in which um, he's about to go and take the uh, son and daughter of the person who's deceased and actually sit them on the two chairs and crown them the king and the queen of future generations, effectively metaphorically recovering that lost ancient Hmong kingdom, if that makes sense. Now, this is not a millenarian group. This is a traditional uh, Hmong funeral, right? Um, and so he's picking the son up and sitting him down. He's saying, you are going to be a king and a leader and to lead the next generation to basically, and, and to use the literal term for king. In other words, we're going to, uh, we don't have it now, we've been a sort of oppressed minority people, but we're recovering right now in this movement, um, you know, kingship and queenship for the next generation. So again, two points, while most people are, Hmong people are not part of the movement, these movements are broadly distributed, and there's a deep ritual ingrainment of this millenarian ethos, even in the traditional religious structures, if that makes sense. So, 
Let's think about the, uh, the, the argument here. There's a rich history of uh, anthropological scholarship that deals with, you know, uh, basically the topic of this lecture series, right? Preserving and transforming culture. So Marshall Sollins would be one person you point to. I'm not going to get deeply into Sollins' work, but, you know, the notion of the structure, the conjuncture is how the structuration of culture actually breeds change as structure and history uh, come to meet one another. The one I do want to talk about a little bit, and you know, this is not anthropology proper, this is actually probably more history proper, but a widely cited notion in anthropology and really all the social sciences. For you students out there, this would be you know, uh, suggested reading for any discipline, uh, including area studies, uh, history, anthropology, and whatnot. But The Invention of Tradition, uh, an edited volume by Hobsbawm, Eric Hobsbawm and Terence Ranger. And the basic notion of, um, of inventing tradition is kind of going back to, let me go back to this first slide here. So if this is sort of the assumed nature of tradition, the invention of tradition critique is about how Scottish kilts, for example, uh, were not worn by Scottish Highland clansmen since time immemorial. In fact, they actually started as English-imposed work uniform and came over time to become that venerated tradition that was inevitably invented at one point, right? So that critique that... Um, I'm going to have to skip all the way forward here. Apologies. But that critique, it, it's, it's fundamentally a critique of how uh, things come to be taken as for granted um, as traditions. I probably shouldn't have flipped all the way back there. Sorry, you'll have to sit through my animations once more. All right. So that's the in invention of tradition uh, critique. Um, again, uh, that's, that, I think that's probably just about all I need to say about it. But what I'm trying to argue is happening with these Hmong millenarian activists is that they're actually doing... Uh, and on, in one way, a similar sort of thing as Hobbes, Baum, and Ranger, but doing that to their own compatriots, and they're also doing something else. So if the reinvention of tradition, um, uh, excuse me, if the invention of tradition entails a recasting of what tradition itself actually means, what is a tradition? What is the role of tradition in history? And perhaps most importantly, what is the role of tradition in the future of a community? These are the types of questions that these millenarian activists are, are, are posing. So there's kind of two ways that they recast tradition. So first, tradition as we know it, or as many Hmong refer to it as traditional religion, so they will use the term, so Anglophone Hmong will say traditional religion in English, right? Or in Hmong they'll say gu, which is a more vernacular term, which is like, old ways and rituals, or kikyadakwa, which would be the ways and rituals of spirit veneration, and they juxtapose that against kikyachia, which is new religions, which is what they would use to describe Christianity, for example. So they're actually doing a Hobbes, Baum, and Ranger style critique of tradi current tradition to their compatriots, saying, hey, these traditions, these funeral rituals, the playing of the gang, all of this stuff, it's invented. And guess what? For so many decades, for so many millennia, it has not gotten us to reunify our society, right? So in other words, my Hmong millenarian interlocutors are levying this very same critique as the invention of tradition literature, but they're doing so to actually denigrate the nature of the current taken-for-granted tradition to their colleagues, to their fellow Hmong. Second, the second thing that they're doing is recasting this deeper, this deeper tradition, um, excuse me, uh, namely the one that presumably preceded the present tradition. So I'm not going to skip back to it because I'll have to scroll all the way back and all the way forward, but that second slide where it's not about the historical continuity, but you're kind of crossing out the present and you're imagining the present to be in a corrupt state. And what they're doing is they're recasting that ancient state and arguing that we actually need new means of achieving, of recovering the moral essence of that ancient state and casting that into a utopian future. So what these new religious movements are seeking to do is to invent new rituals and practices which they do not even claim to be recovered from the past in any sort of simple manner and which they admit are new and innovative. But the argument that they're making is that these new practices actually have the capability to capture that moral essence of that venerated past 
And this is critical. The new practices can do this in a way that the traditions have proven to not accomplish, right? So the traditional practices, sure, they can promise us that in the afterlife we might recover the Hmong kingdom, but we're not seeing it now. We need something else. So let me kind of uh, dive into some of the ethnographic details here that uh, I hope will demonstrate some of this. So for one, um, I'm not going to work through this, but these are kind of my five characteristics that I've noticed comparatively across all of these movements that I've done either direct ethnographic research with or archival research about, uh, namely, uh, you know, pointing out number one, all of them need a writing system. Despite the fact that Hmong traditional religion is, uh, is an overtly oral tradition, all of these new religious movements, uniformly, they need to create a writing system or have a writing system revealed by the God of heaven. And that plays a key role in all of these frameworks. So orthographies are central to all of this, to this millenarian imagination. And there's actually a rich oral history about writing systems and so on that we could go into. Um, second, they cast the traditional canon of ritual practice as idiosyncratic, fallen, corrupted, and borrowing too heavily from Chinese or Lao traditions. So, for example, you know, the tie, uh, but, uh, tying the strings around wrists, Hmong and China don't do that. So they'll say, hey, look, we picked that up as we migrated through Southwest China, or Southeast Asia, rather. That's a corrupted tradition. That's not going to unify us. Um, and so on. And oftentimes there's a messianic figure. I'm going to move on for the sake of time. So let me tell you about uh, one of these movements that I've spent the most time with. So uh, this group is called Ibiminu. That's their own uh, name for themselves. And um, their movement began a couple of decades ago, as their leader narrates, when the founding prophet was visited by God. Through revelation, this prophet received a new divine orthography for the Hmong language. And he actually wrote... Uh, extensive scriptural codices of the revelations pertaining to the Hmong and their place in the world. These scriptures and teachings develop an elaborate narrative of ancient loss, expounding on the details of the more general narratives of Hmong folklore and ritual texts, and they contain prophecies concerning the future global economic and political prosperity for all Hmong. The basic uh, structure of this narrative follows the general tenets that I outline above, but Ibiminu's version fills out many of the details that were ostensibly lost over a millennia of migration and telling and retelling of this history. So they claim to have recovered the true history that's not there in the traditional, traditional folklore, right? The Ibiminu narrative concludes with a prediction that their religious movement will become, as they describe it, the fifth pillar of major world religions. So this is the interesting thing, is it's not a movement for the world. It's a movement for Hmong people in the world. They don't want to convert Christians. They don't want to convert Buddhists. They don't want to convert, uh, you know, uh, uh, Muslims. They want to raise Hmong society and Hmong religion to be a world religion for Hmong people. And in their cosmology, in fact, you know, Arabic is the divinely ordained language for that religion, as is the Romanized script for Christianity and so on and so on. They are trying to propagate the Hmong-specific religion that puts Hmong people as one of those pillars of world religions, as he described it. Um, and in, in doing, so I'm going to depart from my text here for the sake of time. In doing, they have to cast the traditional rituals as fallen and problematic in a, in a number of different ways. Um, so a couple of slides here. So this is from their you know, book of First Nephi or book of Genesis, whatever you want to call it in their, uh, in their uh, body of scriptures, and it's actually a primer on the orthography. So, you know, Genesis chapter 1, uh, here's all of the uh, characters in our orthography, divine, uh, divinely revealed by God, and here's a primer, you know, da for tia, you know, k is for knife, basically, and then some language in, in that script. Um, here's some plates from those scriptures. By the way, um, I, I get into this a bit in the paper, but there's this whole sort of like reflexive dimension where in, when I started doing work with this group, I was interpreted into the theology in a certain sort of way where, uh, you know, they cited, and I, I have good friends in the movement, and I've tried to figure out whether this was them trying to manipulate me or uh, massage my ego or what, but I was told that I was fulfilling a prophecy of helping them establish those global relationships that are needed to actually found a Hmong state. And I've, a lot of my fieldwork has been trying to assuage those expectations and assumptions 
Although one of the things I helped them do for various reasons was to archive their scriptures in the Library of Congress. But of course, in doing so, that's taken as, aha, the American government is recognizing us, right? So it's this complicated set of things about how the movement sort of like sees them, how they're interpreting different elements. Um, so with students in actually a 2013 field school, we digitized their scriptures. One of the volumes had been lost due to water damage, uh, which you know, uh, struck you know, many of us as, as tragic. So we digitized those and put them out. And they're actually archived in the Library of Congress to be read. But this is, these are plates from those volumes of scripture written by the hand of the prophet. Here's a, a chalkboard in one of their instruction uh, locations in a, in a sacred location. Uh, this is a depiction of the prophet uh, Minu, so the founding prophet um, of the movement who had this vision from God, revealed the orthography, um, and so on. Uh, let's see. I need to wrap up pretty quick here, so I'm going to skip ahead just a little bit. This is, the, uh, this is a millenarian leader in Australia, um, and I'll show you a couple of... Oh, sorry. Uh, that's actually from the Thailand group. There's all of this stuff about sacred space, and uh, actually, which is, you know, that this is a, a, a latitude longitude coordinates on both of these uh, being mapped onto. There's this ambiguous in, in Hmong uh, place, uh, land and place is how you gloss country, and they've actually gained concessions from the Thai country, the Thai government, to have a land and place within the uh, national forest, which is actually pretty incredible because national forest policy has been used to oppress and drive out Highland peoples uh, from their lands. So they can say to Hmong people on the one hand, in Hmong, we have a Hmong country, which to the Thai government is, oh, just like a Hmong cultural preserve, right? Uh, so there's all these interesting things going on with that. This is from the group in Australia. I don't have time to unpack this, but this is a, human, uh, a humanoid Pangea. Right? You can see, actually, this is the separation of the continents, but also it's sort of like it's, it's an alive figure. So each of these groups has their own distinct theologies, but universally, all of these theologies deviate substantially from the tradition. Right? And the big, um, uh, just to wrap this up, the big issue, uh, the uh, work that it, they're trying to undertake is basically to, I have this whole technical argument that's rooted in um, uh, Christopher Ball's argument about decentization. It's really technical, but effectively, what they're trying to do is pass off these new rituals and new practices, not as symbolic, but as actually, uh, what we would say, indexically tied to that Hmong utopia to come, right? Uh, so to say that in non-linguistic anthropology terms, they're trying to convince their Hmong compatriots that these rituals, these new writing systems, so let's take writing systems as probably the one of the most straightforward examples here, that these new writing systems actually have the capability, sorry, I'm going back to one of the orthography, that these new writing systems actually have the ability to unify Hmong society through communication. And this becomes a highly bureaucratized way of thinking. So for example, I've helped them with developing a Unicode proposal to actually get this millenarian orthography encoded in the next version of Unicode so that you can text in the orthography uh, without having to install a font on your mobile device or your word processor. And this becomes really important because it actually means that once Hmong people start communicating in the divinely ordained orthography for Hmong, as opposed to the Romanized orthography that's the most uh, commonly used orthography, then that will itself begin to unify Hmong society. And there's kind of a circular proof is in the pudding sort of logic at play within this, admittedly, and they will actually say that. And the interesting thing is, going back to my research collaborator who calls them the World War III people, even Va, who, you remember Va, April, uh, even Va would say, well, you know, we'll have to see if it actually does unify Hmong people. They may be crazy, they may be World War III types, but if they actually end up gaining steam and unifying Hmong people, that is the sort of like indexical proof that it is bringing about that unification among society. And I've glossed over a lot of the details here, but at the end of the day, the question that I'm trying to sort of work through is how these groups convince their compatriots that their new innovations are actually more authentic than the old traditions. Because they're not even claiming, and this is important, they're not claiming that they've recovered this orthography from 3,000 years ago. 
They're claiming that it was a newly revealed orthography, but that this orthography has the capacity to unify Hmong society and actually bring about that utopia in a way that we know from hundreds and even thousands of years of traditional Hmong practice, we will not be unified. And so I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, uh, so fascinating. I'm really enjoying this. We do have about 15 minutes uh, for discussion. So if you can stick with us, uh, we will end by 3 p.m. But we just invite you to ask Professor Hickman any questions you have. We have a microphone that we will bring to you. So just raise your hand. Uh, Please uh, stand and introduce yourself briefly as you ask your question, um, and we'll move to discussion. Thank you. Please, Dr. Ribber. Thank you so much for this presentation. This is fascinating to see how it's evolved yeah. over the past <laughs> few years, right? So I was curious, so I'm, I have two questions, if I can sneak two in, if I'm allowed. Yeah. The first question is about the millenarianism, the definition. So it's um, omitting the present, a corrupt present, but going from the past to the future, right? That's the traditional understanding of it. But are you um, evaluating that? Because Hmong millenarianism is ignoring the past completely, or, or not trying to recreate the past, but instead creating an authentic future. Is that, did, did that make sense? So uh, the connection, uh, to go back to, okay. Mm -hmm. So the connection here is that, and admittedly, uh, this slide might look a little bit different for different millenarian movements, but for, um, for many of them, <laughs> I think this applies. But the idea is that the present is, um, uh, and this is not so different from so many other millenarian movements that you might be familiar with, but the present is sort of like corrupt and problematic, right? and that um, there has to be an active building for the future. So for so many of these movements, including the group in Australia, the group in Thailand, the group in Minnesota, they will say, if Hmong people don't recognize us as the movement, they will have failed in some cataclysmic renewal. So the guy in Australia painted a very stark picture of the world would have to be burned, a whole new layer of earth would have to be laid over it, um, him and his cadre would actually be, you know, taken up into the sky and be replanted to repopulate that new earth uh, with, you know, the, the society that is to literally stand on top of the decimated society that refused to accept it, right? Uh, but within this framework, the current state is seen as um, uh, basically out of moral sync with both a venerated past and a utopian future, and the movement is doing the work of building that towards that world uh, of that utopian future, if that makes sense. And the point is that that's, that, that requires, um, it requires a, several sort of like uh, semiotic steps to, uh, you know, convince the, the special issue that this is a part of is about religious suasion. So how do they, how do people persuade others uh, about their, uh, what does that work of persuading actually look like? And you have to kind of convince other Hmong people that their traditions are problematic in some way, despite being important and having good things about them. I mean, the, the prophet that you've met in, in Thailand, I think it was the night that we actually took students and stayed up at their compound. This person had driven 14 hours from across Thailand, a Hmong person, to find him and really wanted him because he was known for some of these traditional rituals. He was an expert in the traditional stuff. And they spent their, you know, sat there for two hours, him trying to convince, okay, you've driven 14 hours, I have something that's so much more powerful for you here. And they're like, no, we just want the Fiyang, please, right? And ultimately, he did the Fiyang, and they drove all the way back, right? Uh, but it's that work that sometimes works and sometimes doesn't of persuading people of the corrupt present so that they can see the ways in which these innovations might actually bring about a better future, right? And again, going back to things like climate change activism, it's, it's partly about convincing people of the problem of the presence. And there's a venerated past, and there's either a utopian or a destructive future. So oftentimes utopianism and apocalypticism are a fork in the road at which we stand at the intersection in the theological framework, right? Yeah. Uh, 
Zach Chase in anthropology also. Um, I really like the comparison. Jordan, I think sometimes we'll talk about things this way, like a, a folk version of false consciousness, or the, the folk Hobbesbaum and Ranger. Uh, they seem aware of this. They, in other words, they know what Hobbesbaum and Ranger are talking about, so to speak, and 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 they they know that this is part of what uh, has to be done. Uh, I'm wondering how much emphasis you put on that. Is that sort of the key? Because this really is how they define. I mean. It, uh, there's really not anything technically contradictory about tradition for them. They're saying this is what makes tradition what it is, is there's this trick, as it were, of uh, some sort of temporal uh, pastness, uh, but that won't work anymore. Uh, so in other words, let's put it this way. Tradition both makes great and makes again in making something great again. It does both of them. And it sounds like, does that sound like what they're, 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 they're saying both? What, what we're going for is both to make great and to make again. So I'm not sure which version of tradition you're pointing to there because they would say, so let's take, for example, a Hmong funeral. A Hmong funeral is, uh, uh, or let, let, let's say what many of my Hmong interlocutors would call a traditional version of a funeral is incredibly expensive. You know, they can cost, let's say, $50,000, last seven days. Uh, a lot of time, money, and effort goes into them. And one of these groups in Minnesota, I've heard them, they actually were proselyting, for lack of a better term, at the uh, 4th of July soccer tournament, the biggest gathering of Hmong Americans in the U.S., usually, 100,000 people-ish in Twin Cities. And they, were, they had a tent, and they were talking to people. They're like, what's better, to spend $50,000 on a funeral or to put your kids through college, right? Like, we don't need all of that expense. Where has that expense and complicated and all that pageantry and, and nuance, where has it gotten us, Right. We need something else that's actually going to usher us into that future. And in fact, we've got this new set of... So that's sort of like doing the semiotic work to sort of recast what tradition means and to cast it as a certain sort of thing in this way, where it's actually that tradition is part and parcel of us Hmong people having been a wandering, vagrant, you know, countryless people since we lost the ancient kingdom, right? You, you, have, to, you have to tie there's that the sense tradition... We did. Sorry? There's the since. Since we exactly. did. Yeah. And that since is not part of the traditional folklore. Does that make sense? That's a new argument about the nature of tradition that these millenarian groups would make. Because mm -hmm. the traditional folklore would say, we had the war with the Chinese, we have to gear up in the post-mortal sojourn back to the ancestral village, which is geotemporally located in, you know, uh, ancient China. Um, and so we have to get ready to war with the Chinese on our way back to the ancestral village where our ancestors came from. That's a different way of resolving the problem, right? So you have to sort of convince people that all this complicated stuff is actually part of us maintaining ourselves as an, a disunited people without a country. And we need something new. And that's how they make the argument that the newness is actually more authentic. It's not more authentic because it's actual practices and actual writing systems recovered from the past. It's recovering that moral essence of the past. And it has that unique capability to project it into the future. So I'm trying to sort of unpack the work that they're doing with their Hmong compatriots to make that case. And it works a lot of the time. Yeah, I, I think... Uh, the moral component, it really gives yeah. you that handhold because uh, it doesn't have to be a historically past. That's right. It's sort of Kant's, we are an enlightening society. We are yeah. getting there, but not because it's something that we're recuperating, but there is something still originary about it in that it's what we're supposed to be. It's, yes. it's teleological. It's, yep. yeah, I, 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 I think it works. Yeah. It's good. Dr. Finlayson, maybe? Thank you, Jacob. That was wonderful, and it sparks all kinds of new ideas. I'm, I'm just um, really excited about your categorization and characteristics, and it, it impresses me so much with relation to, well, I, my, my most familiar thing is Islam and movements in Islam. So um, there seems to be an element of these things happening in societies that are traumatized, 
Um, so if you take Shia Islam, or you're, you're a seven or a twelver, there's a tradition within that religious tradition that allows for these uh, new leaders or the Mahdi tradition yep. uh, arising, or even in um, Sunni Islam with radical elements of Salafi. Uh, I know in Syria with ISIL, they were using the old Muslim tradition that Christ would descend in the last mm -hmm. days and he would yep. come to the mosque and the Umad mosque in Damascus to yep. lead against the Antichrist. So there seems to have to be an element within these traditions that when crisis comes or psychological, physical trauma occurs, that it somehow is one of the generating engines that, that allows these things to arise. And I, I wish you had more time to talk about how that fits into the brief mention you did of the, of the Hmong funeral. So uh, your, your question is, how do those sort of like punctuated historical traumas factor into the? The actual uh, characteristics of the original tradi so-called traditional religion has venues within it that allow these new yeah. movements to be accepted. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, and so that's, so that's arguably why the, the broad-based cosmological foundation, like there's so much stuff in Hmong traditional religion, uh, traditional ritual practice, uh, you know, and, and here's the thing, a lot of, so many Hmong people don't actually have direct access to it, like they sit there in funerals, but they don't necessarily, they get bits and pieces of the arcane ritual uh, verbiage in which it's chanted, but those who do listen and, you know, speak Hmong decently, we'll actually get bits and pieces of that and then experts get the whole of it. But it's, it's just riddled with this broad base uh, foundation of millenarian thinking, right? Um, that's fundamentally about the loss of the ancient Hmong kingdom, what would have to come about to recover some version of that, whether that's prosperity and leader, political leadership within my family moving forward, because that's kind of what most people interpret that funeral ritual that I showed you to be, is that, oh, we will rise to political prominence. And there's all these rich discourses about, you know, um, you know, uh, you know the first uh, Hmong person to be in a state legislative assembly or the first Hmong person to be on the school board in, in certain uh, urban areas and so on. That really, really matters. And arguably, it really matters not just as an index of Hmong sociopolitical prosperity in the United States, but it arguably is cosmologically significant, right? Because it's the overcoming of social political um, oppression going back to the fall of the ancient Hmong kingdom. So that broad base foundation is arguably why there's so many movements in so many different areas and why those movements are able to sustain themselves despite their relatively low membership numbers, right? And I don't have formal membership, but relatively low degrees of support. Um, but it's also evident in the traditional practices themselves. But yeah, there's definitely a lot going on with, in my end of the world course, we talk, we read, a book, we read the ISIS apocalypse by William McCants and think about like the Mahdi and, and how it plays out in different uh, spheres and frameworks and so on. And that was, you know, the interesting thing about uh, ISIL was its ability to capture, I mean, they're under t in, in a similar sort of campaign to convince people of put these dots together, and this is the, uh, the new caliphate or whatever. Jordan, Dr. Haug. April, am I skipping over you? Oh, sorry. Oh, okay. Yes. Okay, sorry. Um, <clears throat> I, I, could I, I make a couple of suggestions, yeah, maybe please. less than a comment a, or a question? So I, it seems to me that like I, what this is ultimately is a crisis of authority. And this is what Hobsbawm was focusing on in the invention of tradition is that like, you know, those are ultimately questions about authority making. Uh, authority to define the past as well as the present and the future. And it, one of the things that I think is interesting in anthropology is how there's a kind of a broad acknowledgement that one of the worst things you can do as an ethnographer is ask somebody why they do ritual. Yeah. Because the response is going to be a tautological, yeah. well, that's what the ancestors did. Yeah. However, in this case... There are rituals where you can ask, like, hey, why are you doing this? And it's not because that's why the ancestor 
it's because the ancestors did it. Oh, it's because it's, the ancestors didn't. Exactly. And and it because it's capturing a quality of that tautology, uh, which is um, yeah. a, authority. So it, it, there's trying to recapture the centripetal force of ritual, yeah. of history, of institutions. I like claiming like, hey, we are going to take yeah. this centrifugal dis- diaspora of, of Hmong people and we're going to reestablish a center. And we're going to do that by portraying and showing authority. Yeah, yeah. So, in, so in some ways, it's like, you know, it, like I, I always get struck by this, that uh, Buckley, William F. Buckley's like, derogatory the immunization of the eschaton like that like that was uh, his claim against like student activists and i uh, but what was interesting about that is that he's saying hey 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 be careful you're going to bring the transcendent down into this imminent world and it's going to create a new state like a new authority and he yeah. saw that as like you know this yeah, yeah, terrible yeah. Yep, yep. socialist future or whatever but i you know anyway the point i think yeah. about this is these are ultimately struggles of authority and that's why i think the invention of tradition people are not wrong yeah it's wrong just to say it's fake and yes. that's the end of the story yeah. but to focus on the fact that this are power struggles I think does actually yeah. get to the core of the problem. Yeah, and uh, a lot, and we don't have to spend more time talking about this later, but uh, the eminent historian of Mongdom, uh, Maina Li, her book, Dreams of the Mong Kingdom, is fundamentally about that power, that, uh, uh, you know, the, the struggle for authority between political brokers and prophetic figures, and she argues that the last several hundred years of Mong history have basically played out on that axis of you know, uh, there's this sort of, there's this paradoxical tension between egalitarianism and hierarchy within Hmong society that, you know, there's, there's innate hierarchies, but anytime anybody gets too much, you know, too much of a pyramid going on, inevitably people are going to be like, oh, that's too much, and it falls apart, and there's always another prophet to undercut and say, no, there's a better pyramid over here, and so on. Um, one other thing I'd share is that, um, and this didn't make it into the paper, but I'm uh, right about it elsewhere. I went to this event at the University of Wisconsin, um, Madison, where they had the diplomat from the Chaofa Federated State, which has, uh, they've changed their name since, but they had a web page on the uh, uh, UNPO, Unrepresented Nations and Peoples Organization, the non-state groups, UN, effectively. And they, they at one point at that time called themselves the Chaofa Federated State. They had a map on their UNPO page that showed the swath of Laos to Thailand that they claimed uh, sovereignty and exile over. They have flag pins. They have one of their flag pins. And this, uh, their ambassador gave this articulate speech uh, making the case for a Hmong state, right? Um, and, the, and it was, was very interesting. It was fantastic. But the discussion afterwards, this is, the room is filled by Hmong studies scholars of various stripes and backgrounds. And one of the first questions was, okay, you get your Hmong state, what's the official language of the state? Is it white Hmong or is it green Hmong, right? And the answer was, well, you know, of course we have to be open to, you know, all Hmong of different backgrounds, but naturally the work of the state is going to be done in white Hmong. And so then immediately all these critical study scholars jump in. And it's like, okay, so your first act in your state is to oppress other Hmong people, right? And I, I share that simply to say that that's kind of in, in, in concert with Mayan Ali's analysis, a student analysis, I think, that very much that there's a, there's a crisis of authority and there's sort of this paradoxical tension between hierarchy and egalitarianism, both within the religious sphere and within the political sphere, because of course those are not separate, that plays itself out. And I've seen that play itself out in the waxing and waning of these movements that I've been working with since 2008. Um, and it's also, there's, you know, various ways in which, you know, the sponsorship of the Thai state at some level is actually helping this group in Thailand. I think not uh, to their own, uh, they don't realize that that's happening, but it is. But absolutely, yeah. Um, yep. 
Thank you. Uh, we've run out of time. If you have further questions, though, uh, feel free to come up and ask those. We really appreciate your participation. Thank you all.